1995, another fire strikes. Fourth fire that's mentioned uh, in all the stuff that I've read. Unbelievable. And this was a big loss. Uh, after the fire, pretty much the book says the next day, a competitor who saw the fire as an opportunity approaches the Newman family uh, and it has to be known now the, the we never mentioned anything about this but Fuente at this point has been making a lot of cigars for the Newmans uh, who own a bunch of different brands and today Fuente makes a lot of cigars for the Newmans and basically the competitor goes to the Newman family and says look uh, heard about what happened I'll make cigars for you don't worry Newman family tells him, go fuck yourself, shove it. Are you kidding me? What the guy didn't know, and I don't know how you're such an idiot you don't know this, is that at this point the Fuentes had, not only did they have like fucking ten factories, but they have dozens and dozens of warehouses packed to the gills with fucking backstock. So this guy was completely unneeded. If I was the police, I would have arrested him, probably started the fucking fire himself. <laughs> what an asshole. <clears throat> anyway, production at this point in 1995 is now at 30 million cigars annually. More than the, what did we say before, 27 million before the cigar boom, 30 million now. Two years later, 1997, 40 million cigars annually. Now, what happened between 95 and 97 to go from 30 to 40 million? Opus X. They're making 30. That's what happened. Then all of a sudden, two years later in 97, they're making 40 million, 10 million more, 25% more in millions than, than what they were... That's because of Opus X. Then in 1998, and we've already had four fires, as if they need anything else, a hurricane hits the DR and basically decimates Chateau Fuente. The whole thing needs to be rebuilt. Dozens of warehouses, barns, crops are lost. Um... The company is in big trouble as far as, you know, uh, current production goes. Luckily, though, they have a ton of back stock. They're able to keep cigars in the market while they rebuild. And the new Chateau de la Fuente is built, and it's a fucking palace. The one you see in the pictures today, that's the one that was built in 98, obviously. Uh, obviously not the one before the hurricane. And if you've ever seen this place, it's, it's like a tropical paradise. It's unbelievable. I've got to go there someday. I, I don't know. I know you get Fuente tour of the factory, whatever. I don't know how... I'm sure you don't get a tour of the house. You may be able to see it from the outside or something. I'm not sure. But it's a gorgeous estate. What I wouldn't give to live there. Anyway, that's where we're going to end our history uh, with the Fuentes. Because from 1998 to now... Of course, a lot of other cigars, different cigars are released and goings-ons, but we're going to talk about Opus X in particular, um, which will bring us up to present. Okay, so now we're going to almost get into the last third. We're going to backtrack and talk about the Opus a little. Picking up on flavor. A lot more nuttiness, woodiness. I think we'll get rid of this. Get rid of this now. And you'll see. It's not quite the last third yet. Band is deceiving. Hmm. Definitely picking up on flavor. See now, the flavor here is starting to. The first thing I think of is. It's more akin to what I would expect from the entire cigar. A lot more flavor here. Very medium bodied until this point. Opus X. It's uh, Opus, the Latin translation of the Spanish Oberus, meaning work of art. And the X comes from Project X, from Planet Plan 9, whatever, uh, which is the name of the wrapper growing project uh, to try to get wrapper to grow in the Dominican Republic. Therefore, put them together and you have Opus X. Could have began as far back as, you know, 1982 when Carlos was traveling on business and one of his clients asked him for a favor. He was traveling, going to cigar shops, etc. And the guy says, can you make me 
some of those cigars, the really flavorful ones, like back uh, when you were in Nicaragua. And Carlos says, sure, okay, I'll see what I can do. And he blends up a new cigar, has it rolled and shipped, only to be told the next day by one of his managers that the cigars were way too strong, stronger than anything that he ever smoked before, and that, in short, they were unsmokable. <laughs> so Carlos freaks out, calls the guy, says, look, I'm sorry, you know, all those cigars I sent you, they've been a mistake. I need you to send them back. And the guy says, well, I would, but I can't. They've all been sold, and now my customers are calling me, demanding that I get more of these in stock. And it'll surprise you, and it surprised the shit out of me when I kept reading, to learn that the cigar being talked about here is the original Chateau Fuente. Now you're probably fucking laughing, like, are you fucking serious, too strong? But yeah, back then, this is 1982, so you're talking over 30 years ago, cigars in general were much, much more mild. I mean, one of his managers even called this thing unsmokable. Can you imagine what the guy would think if he had an opus? <laughs> Holy shit! You know, so the world palette, as I call it, really does fucking change. What's funny to think of is that while the palette here calls for you know, mild cigars, and all of a sudden he makes this cigar and people love it, and, and this starts progressing to the point where stronger people are stronger and stronger and stronger. On the other side, in Cuba, in 1989, La Cepcion goes off the market because people don't want strong cigars anymore. So it seems while Palette in America at this time is shifting toward stronger cigars, Palette in Cuba or the rest of the world, really, is shifting to back to more mild cigars. Crazy stuff. So, by today's standards, the Chateau Puente is a medium, medium body cigar at best. And it goes to show just how different cigars were back then. Uh, a lot of people say, Cuban cigars will never be the same. Well, they're right. The tobacco being used isn't even the same kind of tobacco anymore. But maybe we don't really want them to be the same you probably wouldn't like them if they were the same. I mean, they were fucking, cigars were fucking mild back then. And uh, I know, for me personally, I love a good mild body cigar as long as it has a lot of flavor, you know, but, and, and that's what we're talking about here in the flavor department as well. I mean, with the Chateau Fuente, it's a medium bodied cigar, flavor wise, might even be more on the mild side, nicotine wise, but, you know, eddy wise. And what this showed, to Carlos was that a new trend was on the rise, particularly that American smokers uh, were starting to get into stronger, more flavorful cigars. Then there was the birth, 1983, of the Hemingway series. Stronger still, uh, and it was also the rebirth of specialty shaped cigars, which has a lot to do with Opus um, in the US. All Hemingway uh, cigars, from the tiny little short story to the gigantic masterpiece are figurato shaped cigars. People were going crazy for them when they first came out. There was nothing else like them on the market. And, you know, so it had been proven that people wanted stronger, people wanted more flavor, people wanted fancy. People wanted something unique and special. Different shapes uh, showed that. It was also proven people, you know, with their uh, techniques of introducing new artwork and fancier boxes and cedar sleeves and ribbons that this is the type of stuff that people wanted. People wanted unique and they would get it because after all not only is the Opus X exceptionally full body but the um, line carries some of the most unique specialty shapes in the world. Uh, all the, the stuff I wrote from here on pretty much is a culmination of all my ideas um, the event, along with uh, the remarks made by the French tourist in uh, 1989, were the culmination of the birth of the idea of the Opus X cigar. So, all that stuff leading up to that comment, and then that was like the fuse being lit. Right there, from that point on, it took about five years to produce uh, and get to the market. 
starting with uh, Oliva's Vega Real Growing Experiences, uh, then perfecting the blend, designing the packaging. The band took thousands of dollars and many, many, many months uh, and variations to, to reach the final one that we know today. The original, the original, uh, where you see all the gold, it was actually 22 karat gold applique uh, using real gold. Today, I don't know if it still uses real gold. I would say no. <laughs> I would say no. Uh, I don't know what it uses. Whatever it does use, you can often look at an Opus cigar and see little specks and flakes of it that have come off the band on the wrapper of the cigar. Kind of reminds me of Goldschlager in a sense, if it is real gold, uh, but I doubt it is. Anyway, today the Opus X band is one of the ultimate symbols of rarity, uniqueness, wealth, and potential. Everything the good life is made of, you know? And whether you like the cigar or not, that's fucking true. That, that symbol, that band, is, is the symbol of Fuente's success, you know? And it stands for a lot of things. The Fuente Fuente, by the way, on the band, you'll notice it says Fuente Fuente. Well, why does it say it twice? It represents Carlos and Carlito, the father and son team uh, of the time. Arturo is not mentioned uh, as far as the cigar is concerned. It was created by Carlos Fuente and Carlito Carlos Fuente Jr., and therefore the bands, and basically a, a lot of the specialty things coming out now go under the Fuente Fuente name. Opus X was finally released in November of 1995. Uh, that year, it, uh, the number two, the Opus uh, Perfection number two, which is a uh, torpedo-shaped cigar, received the highest rating any new cigar had ever been given by Cigar Aficionado, a 92. The cigar was um, released only a month prior to, you know, November, December, Cigar of the Year issue, so it was pretty much recognized right away as being a uh, brilliant, brilliant release. That year, uh, 95, people were lined up around the block at every tobacco retailer across the country to get what they could. Customer limits were enforced, uh, and even so, the inventory that tobacco retailers received was gone in a matter of hours. Uh, you know, it was just impossible to get your hands on these things. Uh, there had never, never, ever been an event like it before. The Opus X to me not only represents the beginning of a whole new era of cigars, uh, flavor-wise, you know, it represents the beginning of cigar collecting. It represents the beginning of the collector's market uh, within the cigar industry. Before this, people didn't have cigar collections. You know, cigars were for smoking. And the Opus was such a rarity that having one not only made, made one happy, you know, to have something great to smoke, it could also turn a buck. And it was also interesting in a way that other cigars just weren't. Um, and that fact has been fully taken advantage of, just like any other good company would. Um, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. By 1998, production of the Opus X was a million a year. Only three years later, a million Opus X were produced a year. Still, no one ever seemed to have any. You know, um, in 2005, ten years later, uh, after its birth, the Double Corona was given the Cigar of the Year Award by Cigar Aficionado. So, you know, while it was a great cigar and it received high scores, it didn't get Cigar of the Year for 10 years since its release. Uh, you know, today the Opus X is one of the most sought after, coveted cigars in the world. Not only in America, but in the entire world where Cuban cigars are the standard. Some Cuban uh, cigar smokers say that they're among the best cigars they've ever had. Again, I don't know if rarity plays a factor, uh, but it could be, to them, it could be the truth. 
They are very different from Cuban cigars. They're nothing like a Cuban cigar, by the way. Uh, so, in essence, the Opus X was the head cigar of a movement, and one that said, great cigars are more than just tobacco. They require heart and soul, which is exactly what Carlos and Carlito put into this cigar. You know, uh, they, from a tobacconist's point of view, they made the impossible possible, and did something that nobody had ever done before, that most people told Carlos they were crazy for doing. So, it's a great story. So, uh, today, the line is still as popular. You can't just walk into a shop and buy an Opus X, most of the time, most of the time. Nor can a retailer really order them. Uh, they are distributed based on how much business the retail in question does with Fuente. Some receive 10 boxes of various shapes, others two, and others none. Once they're delivered, they usually always uh, sell within a matter of a few days. This comes from me having worked at the cigar shop for years. I know, you know, this is how it works. Basically, depending on how much business you do with Fuente, you get a batch of Opus X whenever they uh, deliver a batch of Opus X, which is usually two, sometimes three times a year. Depending on how much business you do, depends on how much you get. We would usually get between 10 and 15 boxes of various shapes. Of course, you know, you get the most standard shapes first, and then for how much, then you get a few specialty shapes. You usually always get, you know, boxes of number fours, fives, the little guys, Fuente Fuentes, which is a Corona size, then some, you know, um, the most common would be the Chateau, uh, the Reserva Chateau, which is like a Churchill, uh, the Double Corona, and that's about it. After that, you might get a box of number two, uh, Bellicoso Triple X, um, Robusto, and those are the next. Then you would start getting things like Magnum O, Pussycat, Love Affair. And that's that. But there are even more, and, and that's pretty much all you'll ever get in boxes. Then you have some really special shapes, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Let me ash this, and uh, we will talk about our second third before we move on. So, cigar is burning very nicely. The draw is good. It does require double puffing. It has a bit of resi uh, resistance to it. Double puffing creates heat. That's why I don't like it. Um, the smoke is warm at this point. The second third was very much like the first. You know, uh, a lot of cedar, very medium body flavor, strong but not too strong. I'm not dying over here. I, I, there was one funny thing, uh, another one of those reviews online, uh, he says, halfway through smoking the cigar, my hands started shaking and I feared that I might get sick like the first time I reviewed the Opus X. I mean, come on, man. It's not that fucking strong. Your hands are shaking? I mean, dude, do yourself a favor. If you're smoking a cigar and your fucking hands start shaking, if it isn't out of sheer joy that it tastes really good, go to the hospital, or at least stop smoking your cigar. Please, please, your hands are shaking. Anyway, shake all the way. The guy gave the Opus a 10 out of 10. I mean, I smoked a cigar, and my fucking hands started shaking. <laughs> I never laughed so hard to myself without actually being talking to somebody else. <laughs> I was smoking a cigar, and my fucking hands started shaking. Not, not only would I immediately cut the review and end up in the emergency room, you know, but if I was able to continue and finish the review, the brand would not be getting a 10 out of 10. I would probably be really mean and say something like, my cigar was fucking poisoned and I almost died smoking it. You get a fucking one. <laughs> because I was able to light it. <laughs> oh, Jesus, man. You know, that's what I'm talking about. I'm glad I remembered that because that's what I'm talking about when I'm... My fucking hands are shaking. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Jesus, man.
Anyway, sorry. Back, back to the, back to the second third. A lot of cedar, a lot of sweetness, a lot of Grammy honey-esque type notes. No spice. The spice is completely dead at this point. Uh, you know, during the second half of the cigar. Um, very floral, spice type aroma. You know, uh, a lot of cedar and floral notes. Toward the very end of the second third, I started getting some more coffee-esque flavors opening up. We'll see if they remain. Uh, but that's about it. Very similar to the first third. Medium uh, body flavor. Uh, and we'll go on from there.